All right, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, joining us. And without further ado, we'll give it away to James to uh, for his talk, Profiling the Attacker. Thanks, James. Thanks. Yeah, hey, everyone. First of all, thanks all for coming along. So I used to start this talk off with a quote. It was a bit buzzwordy, but kind of generally it got the point across. Recently, though, I've been starting this talk with a question instead. And that's the question of what does Agent Smith from The Matrix I think I crashed. There you go. What is Agent Smith from The Matrix? What is the Joker from Batman? And what is Darth Vader from Star Wars all have in common? And it's not the fact that they're all from movies, nor is it the fact that they're all villains. But instead, it's the fact that they're all villains with motives and purposes. The fact that they all do what they do for a reason. Be that enslaving humanity in The Matrix or building the Death Star in Star Wars, all of these villains have that motive and have that purpose. And then generally in these movies, we'll see those villains or we'll see heroes use those motives and purposes against the villains in one way or another. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today. We're gonna to be talking about how we can use offender profiling to get that motive, to get that purpose from malicious actors. So coming back to that quote, it's the idea that preemptive security is the idea of doing something now, spending some money now, spending some time now to help protect ourselves in the future. And offender profiling is a type of preemptive security. So then if we can put some security precautions in place now, that can help us protect ourselves in the future. So what am I actually gonna be talking about today? Well, I wanna break it down into three main areas. I wanna talk about what offender profiling actually is. I wanna talk about what already exists, some white papers, some research papers, that use offender profiling. And then finally, I wanna talk about how we can use offender profiling in security operations. But before I do that, who am I? Well, my name is James Stevenson. And this time, two years ago now, I was a student at the University of South Wales in the UK, studying computer security. Before that, I was a security analyst at a company called Remote Logic. And these days, I'm a graduate in BT security. I've also run a few websites, and we'll get to those later on. And I'm also on Twitter at underscore James Stevenson. So free to shove me any questions there as well. So jumping straight into it, what is offender profiling? I keep talking about it, but what actually is it? So offender profiling is all about building a knowledge base on a malicious actor. It's all about getting all of that information and using that information to better protect us. So it really comes down to three main areas. The first part of that is information on the target, the who and the what. Who is the target? Are they an individual, a group, a government organization? And what was targeted? What specific asset was targeted? Next, it's all about information on the attacker. Again, the who and the what. Are they an individual, group? Are they state-sponsored? And what attack vector did they use? Finally, offender profiling and building this knowledge base is just about some general and overall information. And that's when did this attack occur and why did this attack occur? And again, it's all of this information that comes together to build that knowledge base. Now, there's an example I like giving for offender profiling, and I'll be honest, I like giving it because it's simple. It's easy to get our heads around. It's the idea of a DOS attack, a denial of service attack. So let's say we are protecting a customer's network, and they're continually getting DOSed by a Scandinavian hacker group between the hours of three and six each day. And then for the rest of the day, it strips and drabs. We can tell our customer, okay, put extra load balances in place at these times. And then for the rest of the day, use what you usually have. So here we're using offender profiling, preemptive security, and some general security techniques to help protect our customer. So if that's what offender profiling is, why is offender profiling important? Why do we actually need it? Well, this is a quote from the Los Angeles police chief, and it's actually to do with predictive policing, but I think it describes offender profiling quite well. It's the idea that we're not getting more money, we're not getting more staff. We have to use what we have now effectively. And this is the same in security. Security isn't the buzzword it once was. It doesn't have the endless budgets it once did. It's all about utilization, using what we have here and now. So then if we can implement these security measures now, then that can help us in the future. So if that's why offender profiling is important, why is security important? Because we wouldn't be here today if we didn't believe security was important. Well, this is a statistic from Have I Been Pwned. If you don't know, Have Been Pwned is kind of that massive online database of breached account credentials. You type your email address in and it tells you if your account has 
has been compromised. So this is the amount of accounts that were listed in Have Only Pwned on the 12th of 2nd, 2018. And this number is really interesting. It's really interesting for two reasons. It's interesting well because it's a massive number, but it's also interesting because it shows us security isn't going anywhere. It shows us security is in it for the long haul. Because as long as we have things, we have things that can be broken. And as long as we have things that can be broken, we have things that need protecting. So if that's what offender profiling is and why offender profiling is important, what already exists? What are some white papers, some research papers that use offender profiling? Well, this is a white paper by Mandiant. It's probably the first white paper I ever read. It's on APT1, a Chinese hacker group that targets Western organizations believed to be state-sponsored. The white paper goes into who the malicious actors are. It goes into their motives, their actions, and all in all, it builds a bigger picture on who they are and what they do. The next white paper we have is by FSICO. This one goes into the Callisto group, but again, builds that bigger picture, looks at their motives, their attack patterns, and what makes them who they are. And then finally, our final white paper, we have a white paper by McAfee. Now this is McAfee's annual threat report. This white paper goes into a whole range of different malicious actors, different motives, different attack patterns, but again, builds that bigger picture on all of them. And we can probably start seeing a pattern here because offender profiling is all about that bigger picture. It's all about understanding that bigger picture so that we can better protect ourselves or our customers. So as I said earlier, I used to work for a company called Alert Logic. I used to work in their security operation center. At a very high level, we can break how a security operation center works down into two main elements. We have our customer and we have our SOC, our security operation center. Our customer will have an IDS, an intrusion detection system, a WAF, web application firewall, or some sort of logging system. They'll then send those logs to our SOC. Our SOC will have an analyst who will review those logs. They'll say, well, what's actually happening here? Is this a false positive? Is this a false negative? They'll then write up some form of feedback and send that back to the customer. And generally that works really well. We get this kind of really good feedback loop. We get logs, analysis, feedback. And as I said, generally that works really well. Now where that doesn't work really well is that generally we're only ever looking at one attack at a time. We're not looking at the bigger picture of which we said was so important for offender profiling. So how can we implement offender profiling into security operations? Well, we can do it because it's already been done. One of the ways that we do this is by latching on a framework for offender profiling to what already exists. Instead of kind of starting afresh, we just add offender profiling into what we have. So the way that this works is we take our logs from our customer as usual. We analyze them as usual, but then we start bucketing that information. We say, well, this attack is related to an attack you had a month ago. This attack related to an attack you had a week ago. And this attack is related to another attack, another one of our customers has had. And then we can send that bucketed information back to the customer with our normal analysis allowing our customer to look at that bigger picture, allowing them to prioritize and compare attacks as a whole. Now, you might still be on the fence about why we need offender profiling. Well, this is Alice, and Alice is an analyst for an up-and-coming security startup. It's Alice's job to do just that. It's her job to review security incidents as they come in. And generally, this works really well. Here, any team will then action those incidents, and that may be anything from remoting into a system, calling up a customer, or writing some feedback. And as I said, generally that works really well. Now, where that doesn't work really well is that when Alice and her team get swamped, they really get swamped. And that's because these attacks are prioritized on time. So the sooner an attack comes in, the higher a priority it has. Now, the problem with this is that we get high-risk attacks being lost in a sea of low risk attacks. And Alice doesn't like this. Alice wants to find a way for her and her team to prioritize these attacks based on other factors. Factors like risk, likelihood, impact, outside of time. And this is what we're gonna be talking about for the rest of today. We're gonna to be talking about how we can build a framework that uses these methods to profile attacks and malicious actors. And now when Alice and her team receive these security incidents, they're safe in knowing that they're prioritized on risk or likelihood or impact 
And that the higher the risk, the higher the priority. So you might be thinking, okay, James, that's great. Surely it's time to dive into our first method for offender profiling. Well, not quite. Before we do that, we're gonna jump into something I like to call method zero. Now method zero is all about understanding what we're protecting. Because at the end of the day, we can't protect something that we don't know. So it's all to do with asset profiling. So as I said earlier, I own a website, jamesstevenson.me. That's an asset, that's something I'm protecting. That's its name, well its classification. Is that asset high risk or is it low risk? Its description, well it's a WordPress website running an email server backend. Its owner, custodian, that's myself. And then finally its user, that's the public, that's you and I. And again, the reason why we classify or profile our assets is just to understand what we're actually protecting because we can't protect what we don't know. So jumping into our first real method for offender profiling, method one. Now I'm a fan of the name of this method because it actually describes what it's trying to do because it's all to do with plotting the frequency of attacks. We take a time frame and we look at whenever a specific malicious actor attacks a specific asset. And whenever they do, we increase their frequency. And when they don't, we decrease the frequency. So what we end up getting is these peaks and troughs. And that's really useful because that then allows us to compare malicious actors. So here we can see two different malicious actors. We can see a malicious actor from China in a blue and a malicious actor from Russia in a red. We can see that the malicious actor from China continues to attack the asset throughout this time frame, while the malicious actor from Russia attacks, stops, attacks, stops, and continues. So then, if this was the only information we had, which of those two attacks would we prioritize? Well, it'd probably be the Chinese malicious actor, right? Because that one is far more frequent, it's far more pressing on us or our customers. Well, the one from Russia is just less so. So moving on to our next method for offender profiling. This method looks at risk. It says, what is the risk of this attack to my or my customer's organization? The way that this works is we break it up into two areas likelihood and impact. And then we then ask several questions in those areas. Questions like the complexity of attack, ease of discovery, ease of exploit, loss of confidentiality, integrity, and availability. We then give each of those questions a score between zero and 10, take an average from each of those sections, times them together, and then we get our overall risk, where the higher the number, the higher the risk. So then if we've profiled two malicious actors, one malicious actor with a risk of 70 and one malicious actor with a risk of 30, if that was the only information we had, which of those malicious actors would we prioritize? Well, it would be the malicious actor with a risk of 70, right? Because that one is intrinsically higher. So moving on to our next method for offender profiling. Now here, I really didn't want to talk about the cyber kill chain. Some people love the cyber kill chain and some people hate the cyber kill chain. So if you don't know, the cyber kill chain is a method by Lockheed Martin for analyzing the life cycle of malware exploitation. Generally, it works really well. There's several areas from reconnaissance to weaponization to actions and objectives. And as I said, generally it works really well. The main problem with it is it's generally overused. It's used in a whole range of areas in security, but really it's only designed for malware exploitation. So today for profiling our malicious actors, we're gonna look at a far more generic kill chain model for computer security. A model that has five areas of which a malicious actor might undergo as part of their attack. Sections like researching the target, testing infrastructure, actively attacking, actions, which is doing the thing, and then finally covering tracks and planting backdoors. And you might be thinking, well, James, that's great, but what does this have to do with offender profiling? And the reason why we do this is so that we can pin these categories to our malicious actors. So that we can say, well, at this time and date, malicious actor A was in the research stage. Well, at this same time and date, malicious actor B was in the actions stage. So again, if that was the only information we had, which of those two malicious actors would we prioritize? Well, it would be the malicious actor in the actions stage, right? Because that one is further along in their attack. The malicious actor in the research stage may never get to the actions stage. So our penultimate method for a friend of profiling can be the easiest or it can be the most complex because it's all to do with asking questions. Questions on the target, 
and questions on the malicious actor. Questions like, well, who was the target? Were they an individual, a group? Were they a government organization? And was anyone else targeted? Was this part of a massive reconnaissance attack? Or was this part of an individual spear phishing attack? And then, well, why were they targeted? For example, why was company A targeted and not company B next door targeted? Next, we ask questions on the malicious actor, if we know the answers. Questions again like, well, who were they? Were they an individual? Were they a group? Were they state sponsored? And what were their motivations? Was it malicious, financial, hacktivism? And then finally, did anything happen leading up to the attack? Was there anything in the news? Were there any new laws or legislation passed? Or did we or our customers receive any threats? And it's the answers to all of these questions that allow us to answer this final question. And that's with the knowledge we have now, with the knowledge we have on the attacker and the knowledge we have on the target, is this attack likely to continue? Because building a knowledge base is great. Looking at the bigger picture is great. But understanding if we're still at risk is far more important. So moving on to our final method for offender profiling. This is called method five, but really it could be called method 0 0.5. Because instead of looking at offender profiling, it looks at offender categorizing. It says, well, can we create a sub-unique naming convention for our malicious actors that we can instantly glean information from? The way that this works is we break that name up into four areas. The location where we first saw the malicious actor from, the date we first saw the malicious actor, the risk score for that malicious actor, which is what we worked out earlier on. And then finally, the last octet of the first seen or most common IP address for that malicious actor. And that just kind of gives it a sub-unique naming convention. So here we could use an IP address, we could use a MAC address, we could even use a hash to identify our malicious actor. This is just one example of something we could use. So wrapping up, we've looked at what offender profiling is. We've looked at why it's important. We've looked at different types of offender profiling. And we've also looked at how we can implement offender profiling into security operations. The real takeaway of this talk though comes in around the next 30 seconds. And it's inspired by this quote. It's the idea that intrusion analysis, security analysis, they're about far more than the tools we use. Generally, they're about understanding something. And in the case where that's about understanding an attack, Offender profiling shows us that every attack is orchestrated and has a motive and a purpose. And in better understanding that motive and purpose, we can better protect ourselves and our customers. So thank you all for coming along. Uh, I'll grab on the Twitter now to see if there are any questions, but so feel free, free to fire away on the hashtag. And if it's not, I'll leave it to the next, uh, next speaker. Yes, I don't think there are any questions uh, scrolling through. But yeah, thanks, thanks everyone for coming along and thanks for Bob Crowd for having me here today.